And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Saviour. For he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on, all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things and the rich he has sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and and to his offspring forever. And Mary remained with her about three months and returned to her home. I want to tell you about my brother, my younger brother. He hates musicals. I don't know if you like musicals or hate musicals. A lot of people arriving in London, maybe you came to London because of the West End. Well, speaking personally, I'm quite keen on musicals, but my brother, not a fan. Now, a few years ago, you might know that the uh, the, the stage show of Les Mis, well, not the stage show, the book of Les Mis was turned into a film, but it was adapted from the stage show rather than from the book. And uh, it had as one of its stars Hugh Jackman. My sister-in-law managed to persuade my brother to go to the cinema with her. Only my brother didn't know a lot about the film. Uh, If you know a little about the film and lots about Hugh Jackman, you might think it's a particular kind of film, more in line with with his action blockbusters. My brother, it seems, was one of those people who thought that. In fact, within moments of the film beginning, the chorus strikes up, look down, look down, don't look him in the eye, look down, look down, you're here until you die. And that sentiment, you're here until you die, (laughs) was in fact what my brother felt as for two and a half hours he endured all of the singing that came. You might think you're in safer territory when it comes to a biography of Jesus. Uh, No songs here, no showstoppers, surely. Uh, We're reading this account of Luke over the course of this term. No musical numbers to interrupt the flow of this narrative, surely. But it turns out that even here, uh, my brother is not safe. Luke has punctuated his account of Jesus' life with these songs. Actually, as Simpo, who's playing the piano tonight, pointed out to me, they're not actually songs. We're told in verse 46 that Mary said these things. So it's okay that Jono didn't sing it for us. But these poems express themes and ideas which have rightly been put to music. Now, they stand in, these narrat- in the narrative like songs, like showstoppers in a West End musical. And they shed light on what has been going on. And even if you're not a fan of musicals, I hope that you'll come to see what treasure we've got here. Because Mary's poem, what we've called Mary's song, is here to show us why the gospel, the message at the heart of Jesus' teaching, is so exceptionally good. That's been the theme of tonight's meeting, the joy of the gospel. But it might be that you're feeling anything but joyful this evening. The only reason that you've been singing so far is, well, basically peer pressure. You don't want to look a bit weird and different from everyone else. Or maybe you're not even a Christian. And you've never really understood why Christians go on about their faith as good news. Even those of us who are Christians and are really familiar with that idea, well, we do well to listen to Mary this evening. We do well because however well we know the teaching of Jesus, it can be so easy to forget how good it is. Easy to miss how joyful it is. Now, lots of people are arriving in London at the moment. Maybe you're trying to work out your place in the office. And maybe you're here to study and you're wondering whether or not to admit that you're a Christian. William, who has been preaching for the last few weeks, described it as being a bit like a rabbit. He talked about rabbit hole Christianity, where you're sort of a little bit embarrassed and you kind of pop up and then run across the field and then disappear down again, only briefly acknowledging you're a Christian and then quickly hide before anybody notices But as Luke begins his account, he gives us a trailer of everything that's coming in the rest of his account, introducing themes that are coming. And his desire in this book is to give us certainty, to give us certainty about the teaching of Jesus, to give us confidence. 
And it's not a kind of cold, dry, intellectual certainty. It is a joyful certainty. Certainty, if I can put it like this, that sings. And he does that by showing us that the gospel is about God's favor. You've got a handout in the sheet that you were given by the door, and you'll see at the top of there that big point that we need to see this evening. The gospel is about God's favor. That is, if you want certainty that sings, if you want to know why the Christian message is such good news, you need to see that it is about the favor, the blessing that God has shown towards us. It's a theme that comes through even at the start of our passage. A young Mary, having just been told last week that an, uh, by an angel that she was to be the mother of God's Messiah, packs up her bag and heads south to visit her cousin. Look at verse 39. In those days, Mary arose and went with haste into the hill country to a town in Judah. And she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted her cousin Elizabeth. And when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the baby leapt in her womb. That is, Elizabeth, who's also pregnant, feels the baby in her own womb leap. Now, Elizabeth is six months pregnant by this point. It's pretty normal for babies that age to kick. But there is something noteworthy enough for Luke to record it for us. And we don't need to guess what's significant about it. Elizabeth explains. In fact, the end of the verse tells us that Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit, which doesn't mean that she starts saying weird things. In Luke and Acts, being filled with the Spirit is always about bold, understandable speech. But notice what she says. Uh, She exclaims, verse 42, she exclaimed with a loud cry, blessed are you among women and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For behold, when the sound of your greeting came to my ears, the baby in my womb leapt for joy and blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord." You can't have missed there, partly because of the way I read it, that the language of blessing comes up again and again. Uh, Even as Mary walks through the door, before she's had time to share the happy news or to dump her stuff in the guest room, uh, Elizabeth is already declaring what good, happy, blessed position Mary is in. Blessed because the baby in Mary's womb is the Lord's. Verse 43, why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? Uh, Elizabeth recognizes, uh, indeed she's the first in Luke's account to recognize that this baby Mary is carrying is somehow the Lord God himself, God made man. No wonder she calls Mary blessed. But the danger is we put all our attention on Mary. Blessed are you among women, we, are in, uh, we might want to say with Elizabeth, when even Mary herself shows us that we shouldn't. Indeed, as Mary steps forward into the spotlight to start belting out her showstopper, we see the blessing she has received is something all of us get to enjoy. And that comes through in the three big themes of the song that are there on your handout. Firstly, God has rescued. He has rescued. Look, for example, at how Mary opens her song, verse 46. And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord's. And my spirit rejoices in God, my saviour. I see the word saviour there. He has rescued. And you might think I'm loading loads into that language of saviour. But it is a significant title for Mary to give to God. For a start, like all of the themes in this song, that idea of rescue is going to be huge through the rest of Luke's book. The language of salvation coming up time and time again with respect to Jesus. But more than that, there's other elements of rescue Uh, all the way through this song. For example, verse 51, Mary sings, he has shown strength with his arm. Now that's not just a comment on God's power. It echoes an Old Testament idea about God's rescue in the Exodus. A God showing strength with his arm was how God rescued ancient Israel. And now Mary applies that language to herself. We'll see a bit more about that rescue next week. But we get other hints of it. In verse 50, for example, God's mercy is for those who fear him. This is about God's mercy, his withholding of the judgment that people deserve. What we've been thinking about this evening, the wonderful salvation of Jesus. 
I once heard a Christmas talk from someone who worked through all of the people involved in the nativity and suggested that the big emphasis was on what they had done. So Mary, for example, could have said no to the angel Gabriel. No thanks, I'd rather not be pregnant. And so she gets commended when she enters into partnership with God in his plan. That was the way the sermon went. And so we should also act in partnership with God and change and act and do better. In fact, the the preacher said this. It wasn't at St. Helens. Uh, Christianity is not done, the speaker said, it's doing. Christianity is not done, it's doing, he said. Can you see how wrong that is? Uh, Mary's song here doesn't celebrate her action, uh, but God's. It's not about her, it's about him. She doesn't see herself as someone in partnership with God, but someone who needed favor from God, someone who needed rescuing, who needed a savior. And that's exactly why Jesus came. And as I mentioned, not just for Mary, this is for all of us. Verse 50, his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. We've all rebelled against God in the things that we've thought and said and done, uh, we've set ourselves in opposition to God and earned for ourselves his judgments. But in his kindness, in his mercy, he has chosen not to judge us, but to offer us rescue, to send his son into the world to die for us so that we could be right with him. And that's a rescue that is offered down through the ages, from generation to generation, even up to today. The gospel is about God's favor, that in his mercy he has rescued, and that rescue is open to every one of us. Isn't that good news? And if that reality has grown cold to you, if you're very familiar with that, let me invite you to take a moment to think about who is doing this rescuing. God the creator of the universe, the eternal, holy, majestic sovereign over all things, the very one against whom we have rebelled, he who is mighty, has done great things for me. Just linger for a moment on that line in verse 47. My spirit rejoices in God, my saviour. God, the one who fashioned galaxies and who designed every living being, has chosen to act in history to save me, to save you. Christianity isn't doing, it's done. It's not about what we do, it's about what God has done, about God's favour, his favour to rescue us. And doesn't that make you want to sing? At the end of this talk, we're going to finish by singing that great song, Tell Out My Soul, which is essentially this song put to music. And maybe some of us are ready to sing it. But before we get there, we need to see a bit more. Firstly, he's rescued. Secondly, he has reversed. Uh, He has reversed. And I realize this often, and this could be confusing. I'm not talking about him backing into the drive. Um, God has not reversed his car. God has reversed in the sense that God has turned things around. I look at the way that Mary describes it in verse 51. God has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estates. He has filled the hungry with good things and the rich he has sent away empty. Can you see that big turnaround theme there? Uh, The reversal of fortunes. The mighty ruler feasting on his subjects is brought down to the ground. Uh, scattered and sent away empty. But the humble, hungry pauper is gifted good things and exalted to the highest place. The great reversal. In fact, it's another theme that's going to be huge all the way through Luke's book. From the lowly shepherds, who we're going to meet in a couple of weeks' time, and who are the first to visit God's king, through to Zacchaeus, the rich tax collector who is humbled by Jesus, and ultimately to Jesus himself, who is sent to die on a Roman cross and then raised to life and exalted to the highest place over all the universe. God is the God of turnarounds, as we'll see often in Luke. He has reversed. Not that this is some kind of political song. 
Now, this gospel isn't some kind of left-wing manifesto adopting what some have called liberation theology. The language here deliberately draws on language in the Old Testament, as we'll see a bit later. And its promise about filling the hungry and bringing down the mighty from their thrones is drawing on promises to rescue those who are spiritually hungry and a warning to, uh, that God will turn away those who are spiritually proud. It might rightly concern some who are rich and mighty, but this is predominantly about our spiritual state, and not our political or our financial one, a warning to those who are proud, who exalt themselves, but great comfort to those who come to Jesus empty-handed, aware of our need for mercy. If I can put it this way, this is not a call to arms, but a call to knees. And not a call to politics or poverty, but to humble faith. That, after all, is what Mary shows us, isn't it? Uh, What's Mary commended for in verse 45? Just flip back and look at verse 45. Mary is commended by Elizabeth that she believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord's. Unlike others who doubted what God said, Mary responded with those beautiful words last week, let it be to me according to your word. In fact, later on in Luke 11, uh, when someone says to Jesus, blessed is the womb that bore you and the breasts at which you nursed, Jesus' reply went, blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and keep it. Uh, What Mary gets right is humble faith. At Jesus' conception and throughout this account, God brings down the proud, but exalts those of humble estate. A few years ago, a friend of mine who's not, who at the time wasn't a Christian came with me to St. Helens and he complained to me afterwards about this idea of God reversing. He hated the idea that God might turn things around, that God might reach down for the humble and lift them up that people might not get what they deserve. He found it deeply offensive. But can we see how good it is? Imagine for a moment that God did nothing with it, left things as they were, and the proud remained proud in the thoughts of their hearts. Those who exalt themselves remain in their self-imposed thrones. And heaven somehow gets filled with those who arrogantly strut around and talk about how blessed heaven is to have them there. Or worse than that, imagine it with the other way around. Imagine that God did the opposite of this. The proud are exalted even further and the humble pushed further down. The rich given yet more and the hungry having what they have taken away. But instead, God is a God who scatters the proud and exalts the humble, who fills the hungry with good things and the rich he sends away empty. So the one who exalts himself, God warns of judgment. But to the one who humbles themselves, well, God will lift them up. To anyone who comes to Jesus empty-handed, aware of their need for mercy, Jesus is ready to give it. His mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. And so that offer is for you today. Christianity isn't doing, it's done. It's not about what we do, but about what God has done. It is about his favor, his favor to turn things around. And when we see that, doesn't it make us want to sing? Don't worry, I'm not going to. But doesn't it make us want to sing this? Well, we're not ready yet. Luke and Mary, they've got one more thing to introduce us to. God has rescued, he's reversed, and then thirdly, he has remembered He's remembered. Look with me at verse 54. God has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and to his offspring forever. As Mary brings her song to a close, she makes explicit what has been implied throughout, that what God is doing is is a fulfillment of promises that he made in the Old Testament. He has acted, to use her language, in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers. If you know anything about the Bible, you'll know that it's split into two sections, the Old Testament, which is everything before Jesus, and the New Testament, everything since. And the Old Testament is filled with promises that were spoken over hundreds of years before Jesus. Amongst the earliest of those was God's promise to Abraham. 
a promise that he added to over time to successive generations of Abraham's descendants. And by the time Jesus came, it was nothing less than the promise of a whole new creation with everything that spoils this creation gone and at its heart, a perfect relationship with the God who made us, whom we will see face to face. And Mary says, that is what is being fulfilled. Verse 54, he has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and to his offspring forever. Like the, it's a bit like the spiritual equivalent of the tip of an iceberg. You know, all know that phrase, the tip of the iceberg, and recognizing that the bit of an iceberg that you can see at the top is just a, a tiny, tiny amount compared to everything that's underneath. I can still remember the time when I was first shown a kind of cross-section image of an iceberg floating. And I was stunned. This, I already thought icebergs were pretty impressive, uh, big things. And to discover that most of it is below the surface, well, that was to escalate it to a whole other order of impressiveness. Well, so with the coming of Jesus. Some of us might only have glimpsed the tip of the iceberg, maybe just what you can read about in the Gospels, or even the whole of the New Testament. And it looks impressive. But when you realize that it's connected with this whole wealth of promises made over centuries before, the glorious climax of God's great plan of mercy that it was anticipated throughout the Old Testament. One of the clearest links back in this passage is to the book of 1 Samuel, where a woman called Hannah praises God, similarly after miraculously becoming pregnant. You can check it out later. The reference is there on the handouts. But in so many ways, it feels like the same song, the same as Mary's, a praise to God for bringing down the mighty and humbling the proud, but feeding the hungry and exalting the humble. Mary's song is a kind of tribute to Hannah's from hundreds of years before. But I was talking to Cassie, one of the student workers at St. Helens here. I was talking to her about it a few weeks ago, and she really helped me to see the significance of this. She said, well, of course, it's all about the tenses. And I tried to nod along and pretend I knew what she was talking about, but I didn't really know, and I asked her to tell me more. And she helped me to see this. Hannah's song is all about the nature of God and the future, promises about the future. So if you check it out later, you'll see as she says things like, this is what God's like, he will guard, he will judge, he will exalt. Hannah's prayer is promise. But Mary's prayer is different. Mary's song is fulfillment. Did you notice it? Verse 51, he has. Verse 52, he has. Verse 53, he has. Verse 54, he has. It's no longer the idea of a promise coming just around the corner. Your promise has been dispatched and will be delivered in three to five working centuries. No, it's here. It's done. Your promise has been delivered. That's why the headings on the handout are all in the past tense. To begin with, I put down, he rescues, he reverses, he remembers. But that would lose the significance of Mary's song. He has rescued. He has reversed. He has remembered. It's done. Which is not to deny that there's more yet to happen. As we'll see later in Luke's gospel, Jesus is coming back. It's not done in the sense that there's nothing yet to come. But it is done in the sense that God's plan has come to fruition. It's done in the sense that in the Lord Jesus, all of God's promises find their amen. Even at this stage, when Jesus is just a baby in Mary's womb, she is able to say, God has done it. Verse 54, he has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy. Christianity isn't doing. It's done. It's not about what we will do. It's not even primarily about what God will do. There is more that he's got promised for us. It's about what God has done. It's about God's favor that he has remembered, rescued, reversed, remembered. Aren't you ready now to sing? Now, even if you, like my brother, hate musicals, don't you want to sing this song, this showstopper that expresses how good the news of the Christian message is? It's not just her song, it is our song. Don't you want to sing it? Of course, for many of us, the answer will be no. Maybe you're here as someone who's not a Christian, Uh, Well, you probably won't want to sing something that you don't believe. And for others of us, well, maybe there's so much else going on in life at the moment. The last 25 minutes haven't changed that. Which is why we're going to start by being sung to. 
Uh, not by me, don't worry. Uh, we've found some other people to do this uh, who sing very well. There's a modern version of this song uh, that will be sung as a duet to us. And it's a chance for us to meditate on the words and consider them again. In fact, let me encourage you through this next week to take away Mary's song and to think about it and reflect on it, trying to model something of that in these last few minutes. Because Luke's desire in his book is that we would have certainty, not cold intellectual certainty, but joyful certainty. Certainty that sings. If you are a Christian, you are in the best position of anyone in London. I talked earlier about the idea of people arriving in London at the moment, trying to work out your place on the team, trying to work out that maybe you're just coming into halls and trying to figure whether or not you should admit that you're a Christian. Of course, go for it. You are a recipient of God's extravagant, extraordinary mercy. The God who has rescued, who has, who has reversed, who has remembered. You are in the best position of anyone in London. Don't hide it. Tell it out. And in a moment, we'll all have the chance, if we want to, to sing it out. But first, we're going to be sung to. And before that, I'm going to lead us in prayer. Let's pray together. Lord God, we praise you for this extraordinary news of your favor, your blessing to us in the Lord Jesus. Thank you for your rescue. Thank you for turning things around. Thank you for remembering your promises. And we pray that we, as we reflect on these things, might be filled with Mary's joy. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.